what what I say is everybody's against Bitcoin before they're for it. And your first reaction is always to be skeptical. And after an hour, you're not quite sure. But after 10 hours, you think maybe there's an asset there, but you don't know how you feel about it. And after about 100 hours, you start thinking this is like a, a digital monetary network. This is like Facebook for money. The cryptocurrency market offers a groundbreaking opportunity for financial inclusion allowing investors from all walks of life to participate in a 24-7 borderless economy. Amid ongoing fiat currency debasement, Bitcoin has emerged as a reliable store of value, enabling individuals to safeguard wealth against inflation and monetary instability. Michael Saylor, a prominent advocate, emphasizes Bitcoin's potential as digital property that transcends borders, providing unmatched security and long-term storage for capital. You know, one of the rules of Bitcoin is that uh, Bitcoin's on a need to know basis. Uh, you have to need to know about Bitcoin before you'll open your mind to it. It's a paradigm shift. And and um, I would refer to it as digital energy. But if you think about it, uh, the first time we figured out how to channel energy in cyberspace, uh, it's just as profound as if you went to somebody in 1800 and said, you know, one day we're going to have this clean, silent electricity and you're not going to be able to see it or touch it, but it's going to power every single machine in your factory and it's going to power everything in your house. And you would think, you know, I don't get it. I don't need it. And until someone shows you what it can do and until you get to the point where you do need it, you're not going to be. You're not going to embrace a new form of energy. And so, MicroStrategy didn't really need Bitcoin until 2020, and then during the COVID lockdown crisis, we realized that all of our capital was uh, kind of a melting ice cube. We had a lot of money that was generating zero percent interest, losing 15 to 20 percent of its value a year. So we had a need to know. And then we started thinking, maybe there's something else we can invest this money in. And we discovered Bitcoin, which I think is digital capital. I mean, the most powerful application of digital energy is capital. So we needed it. We found it. Uh, we embraced it. And uh, we become the largest public holder of Bitcoin. You know what? what? What I say is everybody's against Bitcoin before they're for it. And your first reaction is always to be skeptical. And after an hour, you're not quite sure. But after 10 hours, you think maybe there's an asset there, but you don't know how you feel about it. And after about 100 hours, you start thinking this is like a, a digital monetary network. This is like Facebook for money. And so I would say I started skeptical. And then uh, because I had a need to figure it out, I became a believer. Well, so first of all, what Satoshi discovered was how I send something of value between two, uh, two different individuals without a trusted intermediary. So that's known as solving the double spend problem. But if I want to send a million dollars for me to you without a bank, Satoshi solved that. But inadvertently, when Satoshi solved that problem, Satoshi figured out not just how to send a million dollars from New York to Tokyo without an inter intermediary, but how to send a million dollars forward in time 30 years without an intermediary. If you can, if you can uh, transfer something without an intermediary, then you can store something without an intermediary. So the killer app of Bitcoin is the store of value in cyberspace. And what's that worth? There's about $900 trillion worth of wealth in the world, and about half of it is used uh, for its utility value. People buy assets for their utility. They buy houses and buildings and, and boats and planes and, and pieces of art because they want to use them, look at them. But the other half of that wealth is, is assets that are purchased as a long-term capital investment or as a store of value. So $450 trillion of the world is long-term capital. And so when I want to, if I take you and I drop you in Africa and I say, here, take $100 million, buy anything you want anywhere in Africa, but you got to keep it for 30 years. Saylor explains that Bitcoin solves the double spend problem, allowing value transfer without intermediaries, 
while also enabling wealth storage across decades without degradation. Highlighting Bitcoin's decentralization and resilience, he compares it to Cyber Manhattan, where capital can be preserved without relying on banks or governments. He views Bitcoin as a digital transformation of capital markets, likening it to the Internet's revolution of communication, but with a focus on money. And, uh, you know, then I say, or you could have the same hundred million dollars invested in the U.S. Most people would say, well, that's a no brainer. I'm going to keep the money in the U.S. There's nothing I want in Africa that's as valuable as property in the U.S. Um, but what if you can't have property in the U.S.? Then what if your choice is I can have a hundred million worth of Bitcoin in cyberspace? Like I can have a hundred million worth of digital property, or I can have a hundred million worth of land in any country in Africa or any building or any company or any bond or any currency in Africa. And the answer, when you think about it is there's nothing you want in Africa that that's better than having digital property in cyberspace. And there's certainly no place where you're going to trust your money or your assets for 30 years, much less a hundred years, much less a thousand years. So when you start to ask the question, where do the 8 billion people on the planet and where are the 300 million corporations on the planet, where are they going to store their capital if they don't have recourse to the United States and, you know, property on the Upper East Side? The conclusion you come to is I'm going to put my money in cyberspace. And so Bitcoin's real use is it's digital property in cyberspace. It is cyber Manhattan. It is uh, a place where you can store your capital and give it to your great grandchildren. And you know that you're not going to be taking risk against a, a bank as a counterparty or co another company or country or currency or culture. When you don't want to take risk, when you don't want to make an investment, uh, when you don't want to bet on the direction of the commodities market, when you just want to store some money for 100 years, and forget about it. Well, you put. Well, um, the question that you're asking is the same question that I had to ask as the fiduciary responsible for five hundred million dollars of my shareholders' money back in 2020. I said, sure. before I invest in this, is uh, is it going to be hacked? Is it going to be banned? Is it going to be copied? Those are the big three questions. And it's hard to know that in the first year of the network, but we're now approaching year 16. It'll be the 16th anniversary of the network on Halloween. That's the 16th anniversary of the white paper, that is. So after 16 years, it has been copied 10,000 times. They all failed. It's the winner, right? It's the network that all the smart, rich people in the world chose. It's the bank in cyberspace. If you show up in a city and there's 10,000 banks, and you have a bunch of money, and the question is, which bank should you put your money in? You go find every smart, rich person that you know in the city, and you say, hey, wh where do you put your money? And if they all put their money in one bank, you're probably not going to put your money in a bank that's a million times smaller than them that only has poor, stupid people. You know, So, so it was copied. It's the winner. It's, it is the bank that's of choice of the, of the smart money in the world. And uh, will it be banned? You couldn't know that for 15 years, but the IRS legitimized it as property in 2014. Uh, the SEC approved a host of Bitcoin ETFs in January of 2024. Today, it's held by nearly 100 publicly traded companies. Every major uh, regulator has, has uh, certified it as a commodity, not a security. That was a judgment by the uh, the former head of the SEC under Trump, and that's the judgment of the current head of the SEC, Gary Gensler. So you know it's not getting banned. And that takes us to the third question is, will it be hacked? And uh, Satoshi's got about $70 billion in a bunch of wallets that any hacker could have if they could crack the code. And it's been there for 16 years and nobody's cracked the code. Uh, it hasn't been hacked. And the reason it hasn't been hacked is because it's defended by a wall of digital energy, about 730 exahash. That's more computer power than all of the computers that Amazon or Microsoft or Apple could, you know, working jointly together could generate. So it is the strongest, the strongest uh, wall of computer power in the world, stronger than any nation state can muster, 
stronger than any company can muster. And that computing power combined with the fact that there's approximately $800 billion of actual money deposited in this bank over the past 15 years, combined with hundreds of millions of holders, combined with um, about almost 20 gigawatts of electricity, which is like 20 full on nuclear reactors. 20 gigawatts is more electrical energy or, or more uh, pure energy than drives the entire US Navy. That's how much power it is. So Bitcoin's really defended by power, a lot of power in political, economic, digital, and electrical form. And there's no way to finesse it. You can't kind of spoof it or trick it. You just need 10 times as much computing power as exists on the surface of the earth in order to crack it. That's why no one's cracking it. Saylor envisions Bitcoin becoming a core global asset, potentially reaching a valuation of $13 million per coin by 2045 as it grows to represent 7% of global assets. He argues that Bitcoin's appreciation is driven by its finite supply, increasing adoption, and ability to act as a hedge against failing traditional financial systems. Despite initial skepticism, he notes that Bitcoin has proven its durability, surviving regulatory scrutiny, and demonstrating security that surpasses any network in history.